this morning is a wonderful opportunity to celebrate a wonderful event of adoption. Uh, in my years of pastoring, I've actually had the privilege of pastoring other families who have adopted. And uh, in fact, they both, two of them, we know I've pastored three, two of those families adopted brother and sister. So, uh, and God, we're, we're, okay, I'm just saying to the Matt, Lindsay and Jim, God gives grace. He, he does give grace and, and gives strength to parents. Whether you're uh, the parent uh, of adopted children or you have them by birth, God gives grace in our parenting. And so um, this morning, we, we truly do celebrate a wonderful event of bringing uh, children into a family, a permanent family. And so I thought it'd be appropriate to talk about how God brings us, or more importantly, why God brings us into his family. If, if you are a believer in Jesus, you can affirm the following statement. I'm a child of God. God is my father. Heaven is my home. Every day is one day closer. My savior is my brother. Every Christian is my brother too. In fact, in Romans 8, 29, we read these words. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn, that's he, Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brothers. My savior is my brother. He is our older brother. Think about that. I was doing some reading and thinking about the difference between two major teachings in the, the Bible. One is adoption and the other is justification. I believe adoption is our highest privilege as believers. There's no higher privilege than to be called a child of God. Somebody says to you, who are you? You can answer, well, I'm a son and I'm a servant. And now when I say son, and I know I'm talking to ladies here, so just, I'm going to say this now so that it doesn't have to be said the rest of the, the sermon. But here's the thing. Adoption in the Bible, it was written in the culture in which they found themselves. So Paul, writing to churches about adoption, about the fatherhood of God and so on, was writing out of or within a first century culture. And in first century culture, adoption was always for a son. So that's why you always read adopted as sons. So you'll always read it's, it's male, not female. But he certainly he doesn't mean that only the guys are God's adopted sons, okay? So when you read that, understand he's simply writing out of first century culture, and in the culture, adoption meant adopting a son. It literally means placed as a son. But we understand that in the family of God, God adopts both sons and daughters. So you're only, I'm not going to keep saying sons and daughters, but that's, we, we understand that when God adopts, he, he adopts both. But um, the highest privilege that we have is to be adopted. Now, how does that compare to another huge biblical theme called justification? Justification is not our highest privilege, but it is the primary and fundamental blessing of the gospel. What do I mean? Well, justification is the primary blessing because it meets our primary spiritual need. We all stand by nature under God's judgment. The law of God condemns us. Guilt gnaws at us, makes us restless and miserable, and in our clearer moments, even afraid. We have no peace in ourselves because we have no peace with our maker. We need forgiveness of sins and the assurance of a restored relationship with God more than we need anything else else in the world. And that's why when we talk about helping the folks running from Ukraine, we are certainly giving money to help 
meet physical needs, but you'll hear, you've seen, if you saw the picture, pictures of New Testaments there, you understand that the help that that church is giving, that Brethren Church in Paluis, uh, Poland, that help is multifaceted because they know that as important as all their physical needs are, and they are truly incredibly beyond our comprehension. Imagine just running with the, and, and leaving your husband behind and, and, and think about all the war widows and all, this unthinkable. The needs, the physical needs are great. But just think that as great as those, need, those needs are, their greatest need, even as refugees, their greatest need is the forgiveness of sins and the assurance of a restored relationship with God. And that's why we are thrilled to partner with churches like uh, the church in Paluis or uh, the, the Bible Fellowship Board of Missions has partnered with a Bible Fellowship miss missionary, Dan Istrate, in Romania. And he's collecting funds, and then he's bringing funds to uh, Ukrainian churches. Either way, the point is, we are supporting works that are meeting both the physical and the spiritual need because our greatest need, our primary need, is, is that we have a right relationship with God. And this is what the gospel offers us. And everything rests on our justification, including adoption. But adoption for all the importance that justification is, the foundation of our relationship with God. Adoption is even a higher privilege because in adoption, we move from a courtroom setting to a living room. And we move from a judge to a father. And we move from... Uh, being slaves to, of, to sin to being in a family. So think about it. Even a freed slave, if he or she has nowhere to go, if they've been set free from their slavery, but they have nowhere to go, they have no place to live, they're still in trouble, aren't they? You see, they need a home. In, in adoption, here's what happens. God the judge, or in, in justification, God the judge uh, declares the guilty sinner not guilty because he's saying, my beloved son suffered in your place and he will take your punishment so that you can be forgiven and declared not guilty. And so the judge pounds his gavel and says to the sinner, not guilty. But then the judge removes his robes. He comes away from his bench, and he puts down his gavel, and he puts his arm around this person and says, believe it or not, he says, come home with me. Come home with me. I've set you free so that you could live with me, so that you could be my son or daughter. Think about that. So adoption is our highest privilege. And so the expression, sons of God or being adopted, it actually doesn't occur. The name, the word adopted, isn't all that frequent, but it's everywhere you read about the fatherhood of God or that we are the children of God. In other words, you don't have to read the word adoption to be actually in the subject because so much surrounds it. Now, the background of the doctrine of adoption in the New Testament culture is this. In the Roman culture of Paul's day, an adopted son had greater prestige and privilege than, in some cases, than natural children in a family. According to Roman law, a father's rule over his children was absolute. If, if he was disappointed in his biological son, in his son's skill or character or any other attribute, he could search for a boy available for adoption who demonstrated the qualities he was looking for in a son. If the boy proved himself worthy, the father would take the necessary legal steps. 
here they are. <clears throat> First step is that the, the boy's legal and social relationships to his natural family were all severed. The birth family gave up all rights. The second step is that he was placed permanently under new authority and into his new family. And thirdly, all if he had any debts, they were all taken away. It was as if they had never existed. Any obligations or debts were eradicated. And at the death of the father, a favored adopted son would sometimes inherit the father's title, the major part of the estate, and he would carry on the name of the family through having a male child. The transaction required the presence of several, I read uh, one, way, one place, seven reputable witnesses who could testify if necessary to any challenge to that adoption after the father's death. So adoption in our time is quite different than in the first century. Today, we, we do it primarily for the benefit of the child to safeguard a child and provide what, that, what the birth parents cannot provide. And so today we celebrate our Heavenly Father's provision. Parents for two children, two, uh, wait, parents for two young children, two young children for two young parents. That's what God has done. In the first century, adoption was primarily not for the benefit of the child, though we, we surely did, but primarily for the benefit of the father. For instance, if a man without a son may, wanted to adopt a son, he would find that son, adopt him, so that he could care for him when the father was older. Or, as we said, if the guy's birth son was not worthy to carry on the family name, he would adopt a son that would be. And so here's the point. In first century culture, remember, first century culture, adoption was based on merit. The adoption candidate had to be proven worthy, which means infants or young children were often not adopted. They had to be older. But here's the great news. Adoption into God's family is not because of merit. No one deserves this. That's what we read in Romans 3.10. None is righteous. No, not one. Or Ephesians chapter 2, where Paul writes, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived, no exception, all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. I'm underlining these things because I'm helping you. I want you to see that there is no merit in us. There isn't anything that God sees in us that says, oh, not, there's, a, there's a son or a daughter I could adopt. No, nope. it's not because of merit. So then what is God's motive for adopting us? Why did he do it? That's the question we should be asking ourselves. If adoption is such the, a high privilege, what, what would motivate God to, to adopt us? What, what, is he lonely? Was he lonely? No, he's not lonely. God is Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's eternal, and he's eternally Trinity. There's eternal fellowship. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit. These are three persons in the Trinity. They were not lonely. Was he less than he could be without us? No. Did he need us? No. Why? I have four reasons that I find in the first chapter of Ephesians. And so I ask you to turn there. In a Bible, Ephesians chapter 1. I had Mike read Romans 8 because that's, that's kind of the main section, and that section's just way too huge for... Now, then I'd have to have another series on adoption. I, I just can't do that. So uh, Ephesians 1 is a little, a little shorter and more succinct, and 
uh, good for uh, one sermon on its own on this topic. Why is it that God would adopt us? And I have four reasons here in this text, and here's the first. God adopts us out of sheer love. This is the reason, really, why God chose the people of Israel. When, you know, he talked, when Moses preached Deuteronomy, preached to the people before he died, before the people went into the promised land, Moses kept saying, it's not because you are so many in number. It's not because you're righteous. It's because God loves you. That Yahweh, Jehovah, loves you. So Ephesians 2.4 says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. And then uh, in our specific text today in Ephesians 1, In love, in love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. So, if you want to know why, why did he do it? Out of sheer love. Just that. Not because you're lovely. Remember, it's not based on merit. Just because he chose to love. When the Apostle John wrote about the amazing privilege of being God's child, he put it this way, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. I underline the words, see what kind of love, because uh, the words, English words, what kind of, you'll find this often when you um, look at the English Bible and then find out the Greek words behind it, what kind of love is is one Greek word. It's one word, and it literally means from what country? Or what sort of? From what country, race, tribe does this love come from? What sort or quality is this love? This love, it's out of this world. That's kind of the idea that John wants us to get when he says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us. This, this same word, what translated what kind of, is translated in uh, uh, Matthew 8.27 and Mark 4.40 to describe the disciples' astonishment over Jesus' power to calm a storm by speaking to it. Matthew 8.27, it says, The men, that's the disciples, the men marveled, saying, what sort of man is this that even winds and sea obey him? You, you understand the context. They're in the boat, and these are some of these guys are you know, fishermen, and they're used to you know, waves and wind and all that. But this storm was evidently so bad that even the fishermen were getting upset, and they were thinking, we're all going to die. We're all going to die. And, and then they look at Jesus <laughs> in the you know, the bow, the, the front of the boat, and he's like, you know, and there's like, Jesus, Jesus, don't you care that we perish? And uh, be still. Be still. And then glassy, glassy sea, just flat. And then, and, and so the reaction, the reaction, Mark 4.40, and they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? You see, at first they were afraid of the storm. The storm was, you know, they're tossing their cookies because of the storm. And now, and now the storm is gone, but their fear is, has returned only tenfold because now they're in the boat with the person who can speak to wind and waves and the waves obey. Now they're really afraid. And so they respond with this, who then is this? Who is this? Who are we in the boat with? You get the idea of this word, what sort of? What, see what kind of love this is. You see, 1 John 3, see, capital, that's my capitalization. 
see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. So the force of see what kind of love is meant to take our breath away. John the Apostle intends that you and I would sit in stunned silence as we see, as we investigate, look intently at the love of God. So it's this astonishment, it's this wonder and awe that are loaded into the phrase, see what kind of love the Father has given to us, that what? That we should be called, of all things, children of God. It's as if it's too good to be true. You see, in in adoption, God takes the newborn child of God and, so to speak, places him or her on his knee and says... You are mine. You are my son. You are an heir. I love you like, are you ready for this? I love you like I love my son, my son Jesus. Now, you might be thinking, whoa, whoa, did you just say that in adoption, God takes us into his family and loves us just like he loves his son Jesus, the son of God? Where did you get that from, pastor? (laughs) Well, look at, Jesus' prayer in John chapter 17, Jesus said, he's praying to the Father, he says, I in them, he's talking about his disciples, I in them, the disciples, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, unified, so that the world may know, know what? Two things, that you sent me, and what's the second thing? Loved them. That's us love them even as you love me the highest privilege that we have as believers is that god loves us and loves us to the same degree that he loves his eternal beloved son have you ever let that sink in This is the degree to which he loves those who trust in him. So, why does he adopt us who believe? Out of sheer love for those whom he has chosen. But there's a second motive for adopting us. And that is this. It is based, back in Ephesians chapter 1, it is based on the purpose of his will. Look at Ephesians 1, 5, B. It says, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose. And that, depending on the translation you have, you may even have good pleasure. God's purpose is his good pleasure, the good pleasure of his will, the purpose of his will. So purpose, that word translated purpose, carries with it the idea of delight. His purpose in adopting us is a joyful purpose. He delights. This is the thing. He delights in adopting rebels and making them his own obedient children. There was no obligation on God's part. We didn't have any merit that got his attention. He felt no pressure to do it. None of us have a claim on God that forces his hand to act on our behalf. We can't say, oh, I deserve. Well, please never say to God, never say to God, I want what I deserve. Never say that to him because... You don't want what you deserve. Through the gospel, through the gospel, the good news that Jesus died for our sins and he's our substitute and he rose from the dead. Through the gospel, he simply delights to call to himself a people whom he makes his sons. And Jesus, though he despised the shame of the cross, what does it say in Hebrews? He looked past the joy. He looked past the the shame to the joy. 
of saving all those who would believe in him. Hebrews 12, 2. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. The joy. There was actually joy in his horrible suffering. What was the joy? The joy is that the eternal triune God was accomplishing his good pleasure. What good pleasure? To make us his sons. What? Yes, God delights in doing this, and the son delighted in carrying it out in spite of the, the cross. And so in the same way that the father delights to adopt sinners, so the son of God had joy in dying for them, even though the cross was abject shame and utter agony and loneliness. This doesn't mean, being adopted doesn't mean that we, we never disappoint God or we never disobey him or backslide. But when God makes you his child, it brings him delight because he's fulfilling the purpose of his will. That brings us to the third reason for adopting lost sinners. Because after all, we do stumble in our way. Even as God's children, we stumble in the way. So the third purpose in adopting us is to make us holy and blameless. Ephesians 1, 4. You read that. It says, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Why? That purpose, purpose clause, that we should be holy and blameless before him. So this holiness and blamelessness is both a present reality as well as a progressive work in our hearts. In other words, at the moment of salvation, at the moment of trusting in Jesus Christ's death and resurrection, God forgave our sin. He took, a, took away the guilt of our sin. He removed the penalty of sin. And he made us holy and completely acceptable by putting to our account the righteousness of Jesus. The blood of Christ makes us instantly holy and blameless because he clothes us with the righteousness of Jesus. He declares us not guilty right then and there. That, beloved, is justification. It means to be declared not guilty, to have the righteousness of Christ put upon our account. But see, that's just the beginning. As the perfect father, then he sets out to produce holiness in our character and blamelessness in our day-to-day -day lives. He calls us to walk or live worthy of the calling with which we have been called. That's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. <clears throat> so in other words, God takes wayward people, re rebellious people, and they, he draws them to faith in Jesus, and he adopts them into his family so that he can transform them, to make them in their day-to-day -day life holy, to make us worthy of his name. Now, that's not making ourselves worthy of salvation in the sense that we earn or deserve it. We don't, we don't clean ourselves up to be acceptable to God. Ra rather, Yahweh, the Lord, makes us righteous when we trust in Jesus' death and resurrection. But then he sets a course. See, this is the thing. The rest of our life, as adopted children of God, he sets a course for us then to grow in maturity to be more like Jesus. And so the Apostle John puts it this way in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 and 3. Beloved, this is after he said, uh, Behold, see what kind of love the, the Father has given to us, that we should be called the children of God. And then comes verse 2 and 3. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know when he appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. As our perfect father, he works in us. He disciplines us. What does a parent do? Disciplines, teaches, guides, redirects, draws us back when we disobey. 
This involves an interaction with an instruction in what? The Word of God, the, the fellowship of the people of God, and the accountability of the people of God, and the Spirit of God at work in us. And, and, and in addition, this course that he sets out for us with the, with the Bible, with, with God's people, with prayer, all those things. There's something else in that course that, that he's working in us so that we become in our character, holy and blameless. And that component of his, the Father's plan is hardship. That's what it is. Hebrews 12, 7. It is for discipline that you endure. God is treating you as what? Sons. This is part of adoption. We're part of his family. God is our father. Heaven is our home, but we're not there yet. And guess what God is doing? He has set a course for you, and he wants you to head toward holiness and blamelessness. And guess what? He will do that until the day you die. That course of, of discipline and maturity and growth goes until you draw your last breath. Because that is how passionate God is to transform his children. <clears throat> For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? We have known children like that, haven't we? We have known children who did not, either they didn't have a father or they had one and he didn't discipline God is saying, mm -hmm, I'm, not, I'm, a, I'm a perfect father, he says. And, and I, I've, I've set a course. And that course is all these things, in, including, not only, but including hardship. So Jim Packer, in his classic book, Knowing God, page 222, he writes this. Fatherly discipline exercised through outward pressure and trials helps the process of maturity along. That is a sentence that I wish didn't have to be true. That is what, but it is true. That's what God does. That's what we need. And then he writes this. The Christian, up to his eyeballs in trouble, can take comfort from the knowledge that in God's kindly plan, it all has a positive purpose that is, to further his sanctification. Guess what, beloved? God is not here to make you happy. Although, you know, he's really gracious. And many times he does things for us that makes us happy. But his ultimate goal is not, I just want to make my kids happy. I just want to make my kids happy. That's the work of a grandfather, all right? and a grandmother. But God's, the Father's purpose, now his purpose isn't to make us unhappy either. Okay, please hear that. <laughs> but his purpose is to develop our character. So for the moment, uh, Hebrews 12, 11, all dis discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And so when we grow in character, God is glorified, which leads us then to the fourth and final motive that I see in this text for why would God adopt the likes of me? And that is for God's glory and ours. God's glory and ours. According to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, we read, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose, the good pleasure of his will, and then what? To the praise of his glorious grace. And when we studied this text uh, many months before, we saw that, that phrase, to the praise of his glorious grace, that's repeated at least three times right in that context. This is what, what God is saying is he's all about his own glory. He's all about... Hit the, the fame of his name rising up and spreading further and further and further. 
Jehovah's joyful purpose and plan is to adopt sinners who deserve eternal judgment, making him his family, and that brings him glory. And you may be saying, how does showing grace to sinners bring God glory? Well, because he's glorified when he turns sons of disobedience. That's chapter Ephesians 2, 2. That's what we were, sons of disobedience, into sons of obedience and trust. How glorious is it that God can transform a life so much that their, the track of their lives has been just nothing but rebellion, and God gives them new life, the new birth. They put their faith in Jesus. Their lives are being transformed, and now the very same person longs, they, they hunger for truth, they, they long to be with God's people, and they really, they long to know what God says, and they want to obey everything that God tells them to do. How is it that that happens? It's, the tran it's adoption. God's children, that's what God's children want. And that brings glory to God, because he can take a life and transform it. He's glorified when he raises spiritually dead people, gives them life and a new heart, and enables them to put their trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior. He is glorified when he takes slaves of sin who serve their lusts, and he makes them slaves of righteousness, serving Jesus Christ. It's in the same way that a sculptor is honored when he takes a block of stone and shapes it into a work of art. So God is honored when he takes us, hell-bound sinners, and makes us his children and shaping us into more and more of the image of Jesus. So God is glorified. But then, because I said it, the motive for adopting us is that God would be glorified, but then I said not just God, God's glory, but ours. How does that work? How does how does uh, adopting us glorify God? Well, Jesus, again, in his prayer in John 17, prayed this. He said, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them. Them, again, referring to us. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. Jesus said that. He shares his glory with us in the sense that he wants us to be a part of his glory. Now, I want you to go to Romans chapter 8, which was read for us. And I want you to see, again, just a few verses, 15 to 18. But please turn there. I want you to look at it. It's really almost, it's too much to throw on the screen. I, I would prefer that you be looking at your Bible. Romans 8, verse 15. It says, Paul writes, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. That's what you lived in, right? But you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Abba is the Aramaic word for father. So we cry, Abba, like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Abba, Father, if it would be your will, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not your will but mine be done, or yours be done. Abba, Father. Uh, verse 16, the spirit, the spirit of adoption, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. That's assurance. He, he witnesses to us that, that we belong to God. And then verse 17, and if children... Okay, so he's building an argument here. If, if we're children of God, then heirs. Oh, see, we're in his will. We, we, God is the, the, our benefactor. We're heirs of God. And fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him, in order that we may also be, what's the next word? Glorified with him. Wait. So in adoption, God's purpose is that we would also receive, share in the glory of God. Verse 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. 
Now, <clears throat> it's all the glory of God. So it's kind of like, you know, the, the, the bright full moon shining on a clear night. You know, you know that that moon isn't actually shining. What is it doing? It's reflecting. And so that's, that's true how we glorify God. But, but God is saying, I want you to be in direct line with my glory <clears throat> so that you reflect it and you share in it. And we are heirs of God and we, verse 17, fellow heirs with Christ. It says, provided that we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So what comes first, glory or suffering? Suffering comes first. When is that? Right now. Right now. Now, when he, I think when he says suffering with Christ, surely he, I'm, surely he means persecution of, of every stripe or every level, but also if in the context which Mike read, Remember he mentioned about the groaning, that creation groans and we groan. You see, to live here is to suffer. This is not, this world is not as God intended it. When it was cursed, it became a decaying, broken place. And so suffering with Christ means that we suffer first, foremost, because we know him and we suffer as believers, but then we, depending on where we live and the kind of culture we live in, that suffering may be more or less, but every believer suffers in the sense that they live in this broken world of hardships under the curse of Genesis 3, which means that's why work can be a grind. And sometimes it yields less than you hope for. And then you've heard of, you know, what can go wrong, will go wrong at the worst possible time. You know that, right? Entangle up your plans. We lose loved ones. We grow weaker. Marriages are strained. The doctor calls and you get the test results that we didn't want to hear. The job, the job is lost. Well, we've, um, we've eliminated your position. We're going to move in a different direction. You know. uh, Long-term plans are derailed. I mean, let's just take, a, take a, the front page or let's take um, the New York Times or any local paper. It's going gonna, it's gonna to show this is a broken world. And we live here. And so we suffer with Christ because he suffers with us. In other words, he's with us in this suffering. He walks with us. We're not alone in it. And he, he works with us in our trials and our hardships. We're, we're not on this uh, journey by ourselves. And he says that as when we finish this course, we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So by the grace of God and by being in union with Christ, believers' sufferings, are you ready for this? Preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Why is that? Because we are the children of God and God is preparing a place for us, that place will include somehow, in spite of the fact that he took us as sinners, it will include glory. Glory. An eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And that's why Paul said he, in Romans 8, 18, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. How gracious is he that he would take somebody like me and, and then say, 
I have adopted you. I, I want you to participate in my glory. We, we, we're like, what? did I hear that right? And then, then that takes us back to John, 1 John. See what kind of love, what, for what country is this love? Where did this come from that we should be called the children of God? But this is our adoption. We're in God's family. We're heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ. And we should remind ourselves that everything that Jesus has will someday be shared with us. Why is that? Because we're fellow heirs with Christ. Romans 8, 17, right? Children, heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ. Someday, everything that is Jesus will be shared with us. For it is our inheritance no less than his. And we are the many sons of God. And he's bringing us to glory. So ad adoption is this in the Bible. To see and to know and love and be loved by the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Along with God's vast family. That's the whole essence of the Christian hope. So it is out of love. That's why he adopted us. Out of his good pleasure. It pleases God to adopt sinners. What? He wants to make us holy. To make us more like our big brother, Jesus. And he wants to bring us to himself. That we would share in the glory of Jesus, the Son of God. The only thing I want to ask you is, have you been adopted? In other words, has there been a time where you have repented of your sin, recognized that you've broken the law of God, that you stand guilty before a holy God, and God has the right to judge you? And have you ever, has it ever become clear that the only way out of that is through his one and only son, who for the joy set before him endured the cross for you so that you could enjoy adoption and become a child of God. Have you ever bowed your knee to a holy God and said, I am unholy, but you are holy, and I want you to make me holy through your son. I believe in him. If that's never occurred, boy, you know, we're celebrating a human adoption today, but can I just tell you, as awesome as that is, there's nothing greater than celebrating a spiritual adoption where a lost sinner comes to know God as Father. That's awesome. This today is awesome, awesome but spiritual adoption is capital A. <laughs> awesome. So trust in him, be cleansed, forgiven, and adopted. Let's pray. Lord, our hearts don't even know what to say to you in response other than thank you. Thank you for making us a part of your family. Why? Why would you do this? Thank you for, for loving sinners and for having as your good pleasure to save sinners and adopt them, for setting a course for our lives to make us holy and blameless, and wonder wonders to actually share in your glory. Lord, help us as we face troubles and difficulty in this life to trust in you, to accept what we should accept, to change what we should change, to grow, and to become more like Jesus. And Lord, may we, as your children, reflect you and please you. So we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.